the aesthetics of evolution. Charles Darwin saw the continuity and discontinuity of the universe in the living forms he studied, from barnacles and birds through human beings. This continuity and discontinuity is a making one of opposites. What Eli Siegel showed is beauty itself. In Is Beauty the Making One of Opposites of 1955, Mr. Siegel explains what Darwin described in his 1859 Origin of Species and 1870 Descent of Man. Mr. Siegel asks in question eight, titled Continuity and Discontinuity, is there to be found in every work of art a certain progression, a certain indissoluble presence of relation, a design which makes for continuity? And is there to be found also the discreteness, the individuality, the brokenness of things, the principle of discontinuity?" Unquote. The theory of evolution is a oneness of continuity and discontinuity in the very terms that Eli Siegel uses. Every species on earth, a paramecium, a lizard, wildflower, seaweed, or a primate species, every species on earth is distinct, discrete, can produce fertile offspring only among its own kind. So each species can be said to represent the principle of discontinuity from other species. Before Darwin's time, species were seen as so far apart they were accounted for by separate acts of divine creation. Darwin saw their continuity, and so it's now known that arising from complex proteins in the warm oceans of Earth long ago, all present forms of life in progression developed or evolved. Writes Darwin, when I view all beings not as special creations, but as the lineal descendants of some few beings which lived long before the first bed of the Cambrian system was deposited, they seem to me to become ennobled. <clears throat> Unquote. One, the eye. Consider the human eye. The eye as such, Darwin calls one of the organs of extreme perfection and complication. The human eye is capable of a delicacy in differentiating colors that it's thought no other being has. Thus, it is discrete individual. But, Darwin states that, quote, some of the lowest organisms in which nerves cannot be detected are capable of perceiving light, unquote. We know there are protozoa that are capable of perceiving light. And you're looking at a one-celled organism, a euglena, that has this eye spot, which is capable of perceiving light. One cell, no nerves. And Darwin explains the, con the continuity of vision evolving. There are certain creatures with pigment cells sensitive to light and darkness. Higher still, there are creatures which have nerves with those pigment cells. And continuing, there are rudimentary eyes. Quote, in certain starfishes, small depressions in the layer of pigment which surrounds the nerves are filled with transparent gelatinous matter projecting with a convex surface, like the cornea in the higher animals, starfish. Darwin establishes a certain progression, a line of continuity, between eyeless creatures swimming dimly in the dark and humans who see. Two, hand, external ear, sneer. Look at your own hand. <clears throat> There's nothing quite like it in all the rest of creation. Think of any other creature playing the piano, <laughs> repairing a watch, or hammering a nail. Yet, go to a natural history museum and you will see the front feet of large dinosaurs, which also have five digits, like us, and the wings of bats, which have four long fingers and one short one, making five, like us. Darwin writes, 
the feet of lizards and mammals, as the illustrious von Baer remarks, the wings and feet of birds, no less than the hands and feet of man, all arise from the same fundamental form. And on many people's ears, we have what's now called Darwin's point, where the, there are three of them there, where the outer ear, see the way the arrow is? Where the outer curve of our ear rolls a little inward, there is a tiny inward directed point in most people. Some millions of years ago, the ear was not rolled inward at all, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> and this point is a vestige, in Darwin's words, of our hairy ancestors' formerly erect and pointed ears. <laughs> Unquote. We also have small pointed canine teeth, a remnant of our ancestors' long, sharp canines. Darwin wrote that he who sneers at evolution as he lifts his lip over his canine <laughs> tooth, <laughs> unconsciously retracting his quote-unquote snarling muscles, will re probably reveal by sneering the line of his descent. <laughs> <laughs> and in Darwin's words, we have here the indissoluble presence of relation that Eli Siegel writes of. Three, <clears throat> aesthetics in the embryo. Before birth, we literally recapitulate how human beings came from earlier forms of life. And also, humans go further. Here, too, the theory of evolution shows what Mr. Siegel writes that art shows, a certain progression, a design which makes for continuity, and at the same time, the discreteness, the individuality, the brokenness of things. In its early stages, the human embryo has gill slits in common with the embryo of a fish. Here they are. And if I can get it there, here they are. These little slits. The early human embryo has a tail. Well, of course, here it is. In common with the embryo of a domestic doggy. This later becomes the interior tailbone the coccyx, in people and in apes, while in the dog this tail develops and will wag. <laughs> At one time, the human embryo has a grasping lar large toe. At one point in its development, a grasping large toe set at an angle, but exactly the way the embryo of a great ape has. Later, in a human, this toe re rotates to the forward position, needed for continuous upright walking. Once, the unborn human-to-be is covered in a fine down, which disappears and leaves him naked, while the down becomes the hair or fur of a furry mammal. In the unborn child, the skull expands, and the brain attends a, attains a great size, capable of speech, thought and feeling of a new kind in this world. At this point, I'm going to comment on a current approach to evolution that's become popular as in, and as it is in opposition to the wide viewpoint of Darwin. It's known as evolutionary psychology. Two books which embody this view are titled On Aggression and The Selfish Gene. Now, evolutionary psychology, whose premises I believe are false, sees evolution as anything but beautiful. It generally pictures the ancestors of modern people as surviving because they were territorial, aggressive, suspicious, selfish, and didn't take chances on liking anyone outside of the family campfire. None of us was there four or five million years ago to observe this, and it is false to jump to the conclusion that our basic instincts, which made for the success of our species, are a battery of angry protective emotions in our own behalf, fighting the world and spreading our genes across the globe. The same horse that kicks another horse may nuzzle it affectionately, and the same pelicans who might, may fight over fish among themselves can feed an old blind pelican kindly, which Darwin described 
this kindness. Aesthetic realism says the deepest desire of a person is to like the world honestly, while there's an opposing desire to have contempt for the same world. The upshot is grandly ethical. Evolution in the long run is living beings more and more able to know and like more and more of reality. Charles Robert Darwin, as he viewed the grandeur of this spectacle, sustains the truth of this. Our unconscious has aesthetics in it coming from a long time ago. Four, the mental powers of humans. The moral and ethical sense of human beings is so important, so seemingly different from that in other forms of life, it's seen as God-given. In keeping with this long-standing feeling, Eli Siegel saw ethics and beauty as in reality itself. They came into our minds through the forms of life that came from reality before we did. Mr. Siegel pointed out that Darwin writes about an aesthetic sense in birds and a moral or ethical feeling in living beings before people came to be. When a cat carries its kittens across the street, Mr. Siegel once said, we see ethics arising from earth. The continuity of ethics from reality itself, through earth and geology, and through animals to ourselves, is Mr. Siegel's observation alone. But in Darwin, there is the presence of instinctive, untutored ethics in animals, such as, quote, social animals perform many little services for each other. Horses nibble, and cows lick each other on any spot which itches, <laughs> unquote. A beginning aesthetic sense is des described in birds, like certain hummingbirds, which, quote, and this is Darwin's words, decorate their nest with the utmost taste, unquote. <laughs> and Darwin explains how generations of females select the most beautiful plumage in males they would accept as mates. This gradually gave birds the beauty we see now. Remarkably, what the birds see as beautiful, we do too. Writes Darwin, I know of no fact in natural history than that the female Argus pheasant should appreciate the exquisite shading, that's the male Argus pheasant there, of the ball and socket ornaments and the elegant patterns on the wing feathers of the male. Now, in detail, this is the male. The ball and socket ornaments you see here. And these are called ocelli or ocelli. And these evolved. Then there are the drab-looking birds. They don't have the beauty of plumage, but many have beauty of song. The skylark, Percy Bysshe Shelley heard, this is a skylark, had a song, the beauty of which other skylarks appreciated too, in their way. The theory of evolution by Charles Darwin changed the way we see the past and our place in nature. This theory, powerful in its ability to organize the history of all life forms, is explained by a more inclusive theory, the Siegel theory of opposites, which shows the organization of reality itself is aesthetic. It shows it in this single sentence. The world, art, and self explain each other. Each is the aesthetic oneness of opposites. <laughs>